get the eyes of it. Yeah. Um, I'm Eloisa, and this is and this is Peter, and we live in Hitchings, and we're from Kyabra Station. Um, and Where's Kyabra Station? Oh, yeah. New <laughs> South, um, between Armadale and Tamworth, New South Wales. Yeah. Um, and we are pretty keen on Jesus and Mary, and yeah. we really enjoy them coming to visit us. Yeah. Um, yes. And we have so many questions, well... I sometimes get blocked about asking the questions, but we do have a lot of questions that we'd love to discover yeah. um, about. Yep. Um, and today, we'd love to know more about God. Mm. So you, the subject of your questions today, primarily about God? Um, yeah, yeah we, we've got quite a few questions, but we feel that probably there'll only be a number that will be answered today. Sure. Um, so we thought we'd start with what we feel is the most important ones <laughs> first, which might not be, yeah. but we'll no. try well, it out. Start with a crunch, like... Um, <laughs> I guess from my side of it too, it's like whenever you mention God, like people either cringe or they get excited. So it's like <laughs> we like for myself, it's like wanting to learn to develop this friendship with God. Yeah. And it's like so. I guess our first question is, how do we find out about God? Yeah, I suppose that that is a really good question. Actually, um, the way most people find out about God is not, unfortunately, not from God. So what what most people do is they they sort of t- talk about God with each other. Um, it's a bit like it's a bit like yourself and Eloisa never meeting me, never uh, just maybe hearing about me from a third party, and then deciding that uh, that you can work everything out about me by talking with each other about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. And and this is what I feel most people do with God. They they on, on earth we talk to each other about God. And uh, some have the view, of course, that God doesn't exist, and some have the view that God does exist, and then some have the view that God does exist, and these are his personality traits, and other people feel that God does exist, but they're completely opposite personality traits. But really what it all is, is discussion with each other about a third party that you've never met and and never connected to. So what we need to do is to stop talking about God with each other, And start actually talking to God about God. Yeah. And Not ask, just when we're desperate and needy and wanting yeah. something. Yeah. Now, th- there are a number of ways we can find out about God uh, without talking to God, of course. And, in fact, God has designed the universe in such a way that we can discover quite a lot about God without actually talking to God. Mm-hmm. But, unfortunately, to find out the real core of God's personality and and feelings, there has to be a way to establish communication with God. And that would make sense anyway. It's a bit like uh, asking a child to find out about its parents when it was just dumped in a test tube and never had a parent of either, in either direction. And in some ways, a lot of people on the planet believe that's what God's done to us. Um, they actually believe in, in a lot of ways that what God has done is dumped our soul, connected to a te- to a test tube baby created by two parents, basically, and and then God, the real parent of the soul, um, has never then communicated with that particular person. So the the other problem that I find too on the planet is that we always tend to gravitate towards people that we believe know more than ourselves about something. So, yeah. so for example, if, uh, if you know about uh, sheep farming, which obviously you do, and I don't know anything about it, instead of uh, me um, trying to find out it by, by myself, which, which, which obviously would take quite some time, I would, it would make sense for me to come to you yeah. and, and learn about sheep farming from you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, the only problem with the discussion with God in doing that, though, is that the problem is you've never met God either. And if I've never met God and you've never met God... I just share all my injuries with you. <laughs> you just share all of the things you believe about God, none of which are proven to be factual at, at any point in time because you've not actually personally experienced that relationship. But even if you had personally experienced that relationship, um, I still would have difficulty understanding you because, it, because it's still like talking about a third party that I've never met. Yeah. And so... In the end, the only real way to find out about God is to develop a personal relationship with God. Now, that can be done through a variety of means, I feel. Yeah, because some people, it's like, I find it really hard to to talk about God or to share thoughts with God. Mm -hmm. But we can observe God in our natural day-to-day living, too. You can. You can. So the environment that we see around us 
is a good reflection to a degree of God. It's not a perfect reflection because when we observe something as humans, we actually change the things we observe. Yeah. So, so this is something we've got to be careful doing when we're analysing creation around us and how it all operates. How creation around us operates currently is very much affected by humankind's own impositions upon it. And so we can't always completely assume that how the creation is working is a complete reflection of the creator. That's when we start guessing things and thinking, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, let's say an animal attacks another animal. We can then make the assumption, for example, that uh, God allows for the attack of one animal over another. So, in other words, what appears to us to be quite an unloving thing occurring in a particular moment... We believe that God allows it, so therefore God must allow the, yep. the attack of one animal and, a, and another. Not understanding that these animals are reflecting our own condition, our own desire to attack other people. So they're reflecting the hierarchy that we have as humans on earth at the moment. That yes. There's an order. Yes. And, yeah. So we don't factor in that there's a possible third explanation for why that animal is attacking the other animal. So what we do when we look at nature temp- sometimes is we look at nature and we go, that's happening, so now I can make these assumptions about God. But you've got to be very careful about your assumptions that they actually factor in all of the variables. And unfortunately, mankind is very apt to forget himself as the primary variable when it comes to the effects on nature. So, so while discovering God through nature is possible... To a degree, it's not completely possible to see all of God's personality or character or attributes through that connection because of the effect we ourselves are having on that, on the nature around so, us. So when we start talking to God, mm-hmm. do, you, do you get a feeling back from God? or how, like, If you're open to actually being in a space of love and, and wanting to, to desire to know God, is it a feeling or a law of attraction that you generally experience? Well, let, let's first define um, communication with God, shall we? So, yeah, so nice. a lot of people today believe that you can have an intellectual communication with God, and many people even believe that they can hear God, uh, uh, yeah. either with thoughts or, or even with words coming into their ears. And I, I want to say categorically that is not true. That's just spirits that are sharing... Well, initially the person may, know, not, may not know what it is, but eventually you discover that, yes, there are spirits who believe themselves to be God even. Yeah. And when you think about it on earth, there are many people on earth who believe themselves to be much better than other people on earth. And so it should come as no surprise that there are spirits who have passed over into the spirit world who, after a bit of development of their own and a bit more analysis of the universe, start believing themselves to be God. Mm-hmm. And those spirits certainly can communicate to us via our thoughts and and words in our ears. And so those spirits certainly do share their belief systems with people on earth. So so people like, um, you know, a lot of the people who are founders of religious faiths Mm -hmm. have actually founded their religious faith through this connection with a spirit who believes themselves either to be God. And that's why they have this certainty and this nobleness that... This is definite because I... Because I connected with a spirit and he talked to me and he told me these things and I wrote them down and, and there is a feeling in the person that, that that connection was God when the reality was it was just a spirit who is in the same position as the person in the sense that they've still not experienced God yep. and so therefore they're, they're now relaying what they now feel is God to the individual. And on the earth, we have many examples of this. Like you've got Course of the Miracles, you've got uh, you've got the conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh, and all of those kind of of communications, so called with God, are actually not with God, but rather with spirits claiming to be God, or who believe they know God, and and many of them actually have never met God or had a personal relationship with God, unfortunately. So, so there's a lot of misinformation on the planet. So that's God. why the average person out there feels that we're not in a position to talk to God because of this belief system that we created that only people of you know, religious faith and that have the possibility or are allowed to. Yeah, or there is this underlying belief system sometimes that you have to be of a certain type of person or a certain holiness to talk to yep. God. And this is what drove a lot of the priesthood and, and monk type uh, formats in terms of 
you know, if I become a monk and I become holy and I'm no longer connected with uh, sexuality and other issues, then now I'm in a higher position and I've got a much larger chance of talking to God. So, unfortunately, there's all these what you would call there's all this misinformation about uh, on the planet about about how to find out about God. And unfortunately, most people find out about God from other people who do not know anything about God either. Yeah, which is which is like a compounding of the problem. So it starts with our parents, and then just goes from there. Yeah. And so, how do we find out, like practically? And well, before I discuss that, if I can discuss a few more of the problems associated with on the planet, perhaps. Like, for example, you have the scientific uh, community now. Uh, They, of course, um, start from the premise that God has to prove Himself to me before before I can have any connection. And so rather than going by a different assumption, which they could do, they take that assumption. Now, that assumption in itself has certain uh, flaws as well, just like all other assumptions that we make on Earth. But many of the people in the scientific community judge the potentiality of God through the religious format of the other people who believe in God. Okay, so, so yeah. So, so now we get uh, people, and, and, I, and I cannot agree with the religious beliefs about God. Um, because if you look at them, very many of them are very illogical, let alone uh, impossible to... Uh, and secular, that you have to be part of a certain faith or you have to... Yes, all of those beliefs too are all part of this uh, misinformation, if you like. And, and so it, we need to get down to one basic premise. If, if God exists, yeah. Yeah. then God would have given all of her children a method of communicating with her quite simply. That would make sense. Yep. Yeah. Just like uh, if we exist and we have a child, we teach the child a language. Yep. And that language is then used to communicate mm. be, from myself to the child and from the child to myself. And we teach the child that language. So, so it would make sense then that if there was a God, that God would have created a language of some kind that no other, no other individual can use easily. That, it's that, not corrupted. That it cannot be corrupted too mm. much that can be a direct communication between God and the child, the, the child of God that God created. So that would make logical sense. If, if there is a God that exists, God surely would have done that, just like if we have a child uh, through, you know, if we, we get together with a, with a mate, create a child, we engage that same process with our child. So it would make sense then that God would have created some form of language to communicate that, it, that any even young child could understand. Yeah. The problem that mankind ha- does with that is that they then take that possibility and, and they want to you know, create rules and other laws and principles associated with it. They want to say it's only available to the holy and not to the unholy. And yeah. They want to come up with all of these... To control it. To control it. But, but of course, it will not be able to be controlled. The, the reality is that each individual has the ability to communicate with God directly, and, and that being the case, um, surely has the ability to understand the language of that communication. Mm. And it would also make sense that that language of communication with God is independent of earth-based languages. Mm. In other words, I don't have to communicate with God in English. I don't have to communicate with God in you know, French or Spanish or yeah. some other language. Yeah. It would also make sense that the intellect is not going to be perhaps the entire means of communicating with God because the intellect always has limitations. We, we have un- limitations of understanding. Also, the intellect cannot convey a lot of information that God could convey. Now, let me illustrate how that is the case. Yeah, that's great. When the two of you entered a relationship, yeah. there were feelings <laughs> yeah. that you transmitted to each other through that relationship. Yeah. Some of those feelings has, had words associated with them, yes? Yes. Mm-hmm. But some of the feelings had no words associated with it them. Didn't make sense. Either. That, yeah, it didn't even make sense. But you felt it from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? You so. felt a feeling from each other. Now, how do you create a communication method that conveys the feeling through thought. It's very hard, isn't it? It's yeah, like okay. saying, how, 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 do you define, how do you define love as a thought? See, most people would say love is a... Th- a lot of people would do say love is a thought, but actually love is 
more than a thought yeah. because it, it has an emotion associated. You have an with experience it. within the. That's yeah. correct. Definitely. Yeah. So, so there are feelings that unless you can feel them, you're never really going to understand them with thought. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like trying to describe to a to a nine year old child what it's like to fall in love. When they get to be fourteen or fifteen, they fall in love for the first time. And all of a sudden they know what it's like to fall in love. Does that make sense? Yeah. Some of the spirit friends are saying too, so that means then too, regardless of whether we're here or we've passed, this same process is actually going to be there. Exactly. So, so it makes sense though, if you, go, if you look at it, that the intellect is actually a very, very limited form of communication. Yeah. And God would, God's form of communication, or God's language with us, if you like to call it, could not be limited by the intellect. It has to be more than the intellect. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it would make sense that it is more than the intellect. And when I thought about these things in the first century, uh, I realised that God's language of communication had to involve the feelings and emotions of the individual rather than just the intellect. It might encompass the intellect, but would not just include the intellect only. Yep. And I also realised, by my observance of uh, the religious formats that were around me at the time, that many people used their intellect, but their feelings were completely the opposite of what they were saying in their intellect. So we say one thing when we're projecting another thing out. Yes. So we say one thing when we're feeling something quite different. And I realised if God was the all-powerful creator that I imagined God to be at the time, of course, I didn't know God to be that at the time. I just imagined God to be that at the time. And I realised that God would be able to easily see the difference between a thought that is imagined or, or real and the emotion, the true feelings of the individual. And so I realised after that, that that actually it's the emotional feeling side of the individual had to be the primary way in which we communicate with God. Is is that because that's our true self, the emotion? Well, yeah, at the time I didn't consider it to be necessarily the true self. I just thought that uh, the reality is what from what I observed around me was that many people were falsifying their true self with with many people. When I say falsifying their true self, what I meant was that, that many people around me were saying one thing out of their mouth, which obviously came from their intellect, but at the same time feeling something quite mm. different from the, from their emotions, which I began to see as something completely different in terms of the person. So I started to see at the time that the intellect, uh, which I which I now know to be a part of the spirit body's mind, but back then I hadn't discovered that at this point. Mm. I just started seeing the intellect as a very limited ability, with a very limited ability to accurately communicate information to another human, let alone to, to, to God. Yep. Yeah. Then I also thought about the potential, well, that's about our communication with God. What about God's communication with us? Yeah. And it would make sense, if you think about it, that God's communication method with us would have to also involve feelings and emotions. Does that make right, sense? Yeah. Rather than just thoughts, because thoughts are limited. So how does God give you the sense that you're loved by giving you a thought? It's okay. very, very hard. Yeah. Right? How do you give your child a sense that she is loved? Yeah, it's not a thought. By it's a thought. We, yeah. You can't, do you? Yeah. It's by yeah. what we do and actually how we share. Exactly. It's by what you do, that. how you act, but also how you express yourself in terms of your feelings to your child. So if you're saying to your child, I love you, and at the same time in a rage with your child, yeah. mm. the child's not going to feel any sense of love from you. No. Right? Yeah. And if you say, I love you, but all the time you're totally distracted whenever the child is nearby... Um, and you, you were totally disconnected from the child in any way in terms of projection of that feeling, then of course the child is not going to feel that you love them. It's just the words to them that mean nothing. And so I, at that time I started experimenting with this concept. So, I, so I'd use my intellect logically to determine the fact that, yes, I felt that there was a God that existed because of what I saw in creation, although I did see distortions in creation of love which I could, couldn't imagine being God, but I had no explanation for it that at the time. But secondly, I started to examine the intellect and its limited capacity to communicate. So I realised that the intellect had a limited capacity to communicate true feelings, even between humans, let alone to, between a human and another being. 
And, and then I realised that uh, if the natural way of a very young child was to feel rather than think, yeah. then it would make sense, and, and God na would naturally have a way of communicating with a young child, then it would make sense that the way God communicates is by these feelings rather than thoughts. So with the young child, that's when they're hungry, they feel hungry. It's when they're uncomfortable, they're feeling uncomfortable yeah. rather than thinking And before they can even speak, yeah. they're already in the feeling. And if you can sense the feeling, you know when to feed them. And, you, and in fact, now a lot of mothers have realised that they can actually feel when their child has mm. to go to the toilet. Mm. And instead of just... They actually put their child on the toilet and fair enough, the child goes and they don't need to worry about nappies as much anymore because because they can already feel when the child has feelings about what they want to do rather than, you know, something that they have to verbally state to the mother. And once I realised and saw all of this occurring, I started experimenting with the idea that I could feel things, things towards God, which God would be able to then, would be able to hear, if you like, through God's feelings. Yeah. And God would be able to feel things from me and I would be able to hear, if, if we could use yeah. it in quotation marks, those feelings by actually feeling them rather than... Know. In other words, we could, I could feel God's feelings and God could feel my feelings. Okay. I don't know if it's appropriate this, but I want to ask about how do you recognise that? That might be a bit later. I don't know that... Well, obviously, when I first started experiencing that, I didn't understand whose feelings were what so you know were they my feelings, or God's <laughs> feelings or, yeah. you know like it was hard to determine because I had never really experimented with this before uh, I started to connect with my own feelings but uh, it was difficult to know what, where your external feelings were coming from and so what I started to do is experimenting with feelings that I could sense from other people first yeah. so I started sensing through this development of this, I started fe feeling whether I, you know, using my intellect to actually experiment with feeling other people. And then I would ask them what they felt. And if they were an honest person, very frequently, exactly what I felt from them was what they were feeling at the time. Yeah. And then I started realising that actually I could very accurately feel what people were feeling. And, and it was a very different feeling to what I had inside of myself about the same subject. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then I realised that I could try the same experiments with God. So I spent quite a lot of time alone, even as a young child. Um, you know, so by this stage, I was nine or ten years of age uh, and experiment, starting to experiment with, with my relationship with God by feeling for God. Before then, I had feelings about God that I didn't experiment with on a conscious level, yeah. but by this stage of my life I started experimenting with them on a conscious level. In other words, going through a process of experimentation to see whether I could feel God's feelings and so forth. And what I started recognising was there was a consistency in my ability to feel or sense certain things from God. And, and with the feeling, I realised all these thoughts came as well, but not they were thoughts generated... Not by any external uh, creation. So is this after the feeling? Or after I had the feeling, then, then it would resolve a lot of my questions instantly without that me, anybody telling me the resolution of those questions. So I started feeling that, oh, all I've got to do is allow these feelings coming from God. As I allowed these feelings coming from God, I started realising that I could now get information about all sorts of other things because these feelings that seem to open up a capacity in me to understand everything mm. that I couldn't pr previously understand. Can you give an example? Certainly, I can give a lot ex of examples perhaps. Uh, for example, when I was very, very young, I used to try to understand the role of insects in, like I was fascinated, as most children are, fascinated yeah. by insects, right? So you, I would try to understand the role of insects. Now, Insects have very, very complex symbiotic roles with, with, no, with the rest of nature. And of course, because of their complexity, it's very, very difficult for a child to understand. Yeah. Right? So, but what I found was if I communicated with God and I longed, I had this, I realised after a while that if I longed for the feeling from God to understand this particular thing, 
and also longed for God's love to, you know, for, for God's love. And, and the way I saw it at the time was not so much longing for God's love, but longing for this connection with God, this to so, maintain. So in that process, it's a desire to know rather than. Yeah, you were actually wanting to know what's going on yeah. rather than... Yeah, I wanted to know other things too. Yeah. But I primarily focused on my desire for God and yeah. my desire to feel God. Yeah. But I realised that if I had any questions at the same time about other things that were around me, through this connection, whenever I felt God, like, felt God's feelings for me, I started to be able to know the answer to the question. It was just the answer was there. The answer was there. So I started discovering the relationship between certain insects and certain plants and what happened and why they were there. And, and it was not scientific knowledge that was easily available at the time. You had to go to people who were very learned men, usually quite aged, yeah. in different spent countries. Spent their other whole than lifetime. Yeah. He spent so. their whole lifetime learning about it. And, and yet, all of a sudden, I knew. Wow. And, and this became quite an amazing process for me to experiment with then. I started realizing that I didn't actually need to be educated by anybody because God had the ability to educate me through this connection about everything, not, not just about God, but also about everything else. Of course, for me, the primary education that I was attempting to receive was about God because that was the thing that fascinated me the most. Yep. But, but I found as a subsequent result of the communication with God, and the communication wasn't verbal and the communication wasn't thoughts. It was this emotional feelings going back and forth between myself and God that I could feel for God and I could feel from God. And as I received those feelings, other things became very, very... like I knew them all of a sudden. And, and then sometimes I would experiment with what I knew, of course, to find out whether it was just a knowledge, whether it was a practical knowledge or whether it was just a theory. So that's a good suggestion for all of us to mm. do as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I finished up doing was... was Entering this, what I would call a feeling-based dialogue with God, which, which became for me a permanent thing. So I was constantly, before I talked to anybody else, I would talk to God. In fact, frequently I wouldn't talk to anybody else. I would just talk to God. My father, even when I was very young age, like three or four years of age, my father was very concerned because I, I would even speak to God out loud as I was doing these other things, even by that age. And, and he would wonder why I'm talking to myself all the time and what's going on. And he was quite concerned. And, and he would talk to my mum, Mary, about it. And, and she, she would say, it's all right, it's a passing phase, you know. Like, it, you'll get over that. He's a boy. You'll get over that. And then when I'm nine or ten and I'm still doing it, my father's now getting really worried because <laughs> it wasn't such a passing phase as he wanted it to be. And, uh, and I continued that dialogue. And through my entire life and when I was alone quite often I, I would speak openly with God like out loud but when I was with other people I realized, I started realising that it seemed to distress them quite so, a lot so, so is the start here when you have a question is it feeling how you're feeling within yourself first is that like the first thing to do or not well the problem with using this method is that you have to be sensitive to your own feelings first and what yeah. I realised uh, through this process was that not many people were actually sensitive to their own feelings. A lot of times I didn't even know. So we're not them. honest even with actually how we're feeling. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, quite often a person would say they loved somebody when they actually hated them. Yeah. Quite often the person would say that they were, you know, that they were happy when they looked actually quite sad and you could feel their sadness. Quite often, you, you, you know, a person was act, acted like they were fearless but you yeah. can see all the fear in them. You'll feel all the fear in them. And once I remember, I went through this experiment of feeling people first. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I started realizing that that a lot of people actually thought they felt certain things, but they didn't feel them. Mm -hmm. And and that is obviously a problem. If if you can't feel what you actually feel, yeah. then how are you also going to feel something that is transmitted to you from another, whether that That's person difficult. is a person is an individual on earth or in the spirit world or God herself. So, so I realised that it was very, very important to actually understand your own feelings. And so I spent a lot of time uh, in the first century, and, and even I do the same in this life, understanding my own feelings, mm. trying, trying to get some kind of... Firstly, trying to feel them so I know what <coughs> they are. And then, of course, once you feel them, you can understand them. Now, most people on Earth have been taught to heavily use their intellect. So, so most people are on earth, unfortunately, quite dis... The, the, their feelings and their thoughts are very separate from each other. Mm. 
And so the method of communication with God is quite difficult then because they think they're having a feeling that they're not actually having. Now, if I can give you an example of that. Quite a lot of people on earth are in a rage with God. Yeah. Even people who are in religions, many of them are in ra- a rage. So with the God. rage is the blame to God? Yeah, they blame God for all sorts of things that have happened in their life. They feel God's to blame and God hasn't helped them and God hasn't made them safe and God hasn't done all of these mm. different things. So they're quite angry. So many people who you would say, do you love God? They go, yes, I love God and I believe in God. And yet at the same time, they're in a rage with God. Now, what I realised in the first century is that love and rage are two very, very different emotions, right? Yep. And, and you, can't, you can't have one and the other together in the same person at the same time. So yeah. wherever you're in a rage, you're not going to have a connection with God? Well, no. That's the, that's the other thing I learned, is that you had to just be truthful with your emotion with God. So own the fact that, that I am raging. in a rage. Okay. And then you could still maintain your connection with God. You could still feel the connection with God if you did this. And this is one thing that I learned as well, the, the importance of a truthful reflection of your emotional condition with God. So in other words, if I am in a rage with God, feel my rage with God. And that's okay. You, and, that's, and the best. that's what God wants you to that's feel, because you're in a rage with God. And then he ha- you have a chance to get to the underlying fear that of you have why that creates I am in the a rage. rage, and then the underlying grief that creates the fear. And... and what I found through that process was that actually God wanted us to be real. Yep. <laughs> be not, ourselves. Not fake. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which of course makes sense. Yeah. You know, why would God want to connect with somebody who's being fake? You know, like, and that's, that's going to answer then that I wanted to ask about um, if you're in such denial um, and you're not even feeling it, like you've convinced yourself that you're not in a rage with God, then it's through that same process you've been describing that you're actually going to discover that you actually are in a rage with God. Yes. And until you go through that, you're yes. not even going to know. Exactly. Okay. So, so what happens on earth, unfortunately, is most people begin by not being able to feel God or yeah. even feel themselves to yeah. a large degree. Now, um, what, so what needs to happen first is a person needs to learn how to feel themselves. Yes when they can learn how to feel themselves, then they'll feel their actual feelings that they have about God. And once they feel their actual feelings about God, they can start expressing them. So, for example, a scientist who did that, who doesn't believe in God, would say, look, God, I don't even believe in you. (laughs) That's my feeling. You've not proven yourself to me. You've not shown yourself to me. And you can even enter a dialogue with God (laughs) saying that you don't believe in God. Right? And and find, in the end, a connection with God through that process, right? Mm -hmm. But what I feel happens a lot of times on earth is that we, we go through this process where we, we have the feeling, like, yeah. and then we believe the feeling as truth. When I say believe the feeling as truth, we believe it as the ultimate truth. So, for example, I have a feeling inside of me that God never protected me. Yeah. I, I asked for God to protect me. Let's say I, as a child I believed in a God and I asked for God to protect me through some hard processes or things that happened to me and God never protected me from those particular things and so I came to believe that God didn't care about me or there was no God as a result of that particular event. Now now, unfortunately for most people when they become an adult like that they then assume that that belief is true when there could have been circumstances that would explain why a person couldn't communicate with us at that particular time or, or connect with us at that particular time. There might have been principles or other things involved that we are not aware of at the time. So what I'm saying is we need to be truthful about our emotional condition as it is currently with God. Yep. Well, that's how we open this dialogue with God. And if we're in a rage with God, we express this rage. So for most of us, we're either going to be in a rage or we're going to have this enormous amount of grief currently. Yeah, for most, there's an enormous amount of uh, anger with God. There is also quite a lot of fear with God for most people because in in their childhood, most people were told that if you didn't do the right thing, God would punish you. And so there is this common concept on earth that God is a punishing God. And so many people in earth, even in, in, in religions walk around with a lot of fear about God. They, you know, they believe God is going to come along at some point and punish them for their wickedness. So they are very, very tentative about experimenting with anything. Mm-hmm. And they also feel that anything that is 
you know, sl- slightly out of line might be wicked, so they, they even try to not do that, but their heart's telling them to do it, and then they get into this convoluted mess in terms of f- guilt, of guilt and self-punishment and so forth, which is religiously often accepted as, a, as, a, as okay, as a, as a part of the holy process. And unfortunately, we end up with this uh, this mess of emotions that we have towards God, uh, which we don't express because we're so afraid of yeah, God. Yeah, we're, we're terrified about us. the thought of letting them out. Yeah, exactly. And so, so many of us are quite shut down in our relationship with God. We 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 view God like a very angry, uh, par- overbearing parent who has the potential to fly off the handle at, at the drop of the hat, mm-hmm. and uh, as the saying goes, and. And so we have this viewpoint that um, I've just got to make one little mistake and God's got to be on me. So (laughs) running around being really good all Mm. the time or trying. Or trying. Or we go to the extent of going, oh, blow that. And often we use a lot more severe language than that, right? And we go, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to rebel for the rest of my life. If God's like that, I don't want to (laughs) have any part of him. And then we go into total rebellion and, and go in completely the opposite direction often. So, so we end up with these um, experiences on earth where people are either living in what they believe to be in harmony with God or God's yeah. laws or principles, often because they're to- so terrified mm. of God, or they go down a totally rebellion, <laughs> rebelling against God and saying there is no God or anything else because of the rage and anger that exists in them from their child. So that's why talking about God makes so many of us uncomfortable. It's this yes. experience we've had of religious people, especially when we're young, sharing their beliefs around God that make us cringe. Well, unfortunately, though, it's even deeper than that. Um, the main reason why we have so much discomfort associated with God is because of what happened during our childhood with our parents. Yep. You see, God is often associated, all of the emotional uh, injuries and feelings that we have with our parents are imposed upon God. So if my mother was a bit aloof and, and, and didn't take much interest in me, I feel that the feminine side of God is aloof and doesn't take much interest in, in her children. If, if my father was the one who came home with a strap whenever I was disobedient, then I then start imposing the idea upon God that the daddy side of God, if you like, the father side of God, is going to punish me for every mistake I make. Yeah. And, uh, and any time I disagree with him. <laughs> and, so, and so we have these very distorted concepts of God by a very young age, not, not necessarily because we've been taught them verbally, yeah. but because of the interaction we've had with our parents and with any other religious system. Mm. And, uh, you know, on the earth, uh, there are very large religious systems that have a large amount of impact upon people's lives. So therefore, there is a very, very strong indication of whether God exists or doesn't exist in a family, and also what God's character and nature is. Bearing in mind, of course, that the parents don't know what God's character and nature is. They've just gone through exactly the same process themselves with another set of parents who, who, did, who yeah. believed they knew, who did not know, because they hadn't connected with God either. Yeah. So that's why from a very young age we just start ignoring God straight away. Often we either ignore God or we're so afraid of God that we do everything we believe God wants us to do. Yeah. Either way is often very out of harmony with communication with God. Yeah. Right? So, so God wants us in the end, if you experiment with this, and this is a beauty, this is a beauty too, if we do this in this manner... We are now independent of any teacher that would ever come across our path. So it's up to us. It's up to us. And this would make sense too, that all of humanity was created equal. Since all of humanity was created equal, all of us have an equal capacity to have a personal relationship with God. Therefore, we do not need a priest we do not need a prophet. We do not. None of us need any of these things. We all have the personal ability to communicate with God directly, because God established that ability is a part of His creation of us. Just like when we have a child, the ability for language is a part of the child's nature, so we can communicate and eventually establish a language, a form of communication between us and the child. And. And while language is a very limited form of communication because it's usually only intellectual and verbal, it does have words that express emotions. Uh, but usually if a person uh, 
feels the emotion. You, you really don't need the words, and this is why you can, you know, get to someone, talk to someone who's a Portuguese, and and you can see when he's angry, you yeah. can see when he's sad, and you can see when he's afraid, and you can see all of these things, and he doesn't have to say a word, because there is this other language which I would call the language of the soul, which is a far more effective method of communication, because it tells us exactly how a person feels. And, and that's this, what we actually using when we're communicating with God. It's coming through our soul. Well, that's what we have to use to communicate with God. There is no other way of communicating with God without involving that. And this is where I feel most people make the mistake. They believe that they can communicate with God intellectually without their feelings being involved mm -hmm. and without their real self being involved. So with that, though, so all our feelings come from our soul. Is that what we're saying? Um, not necessarily. We, we remember we can have feelings that come from within us yeah. and go out to some people outside or to God, mm. but we can also have feelings that enter our soul that come from outside of us and enter us that, yeah. that we allow to enter us. So this is how, if I'm in love with, my, like, if I'm in love with Mary, I can, I can feel my love for her. I can also feel the times when she loves me, yeah. um, because that's a feeling that's external to myself. That I, I can, I, that I'm open to allowing enter me, and so it enters me, and so I can feel it from her without her saying anything. And and it's the same principle with our communication with God. So so, not all feelings come from just within us. Cause, so we're all capable of transmitting feelings. And so you could say that every feeling has the ability to be transmitted and received, just like an electronic signal has ability to be transmitted. And received, and just like our thoughts have the ability to be transmitted and received, yeah. but 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 when we have all of those things happening at the same time, our thoughts and our feelings in complete harmony, now we have a lot of power in the transmission, and therefore in the reception. So the strength, yeah, we strengthen the whole accuracy of what we're going to get back. Yes. So if I, as a parent, was yelling at my child and telling them that I loved them, so. I love you, you silly idiot, that type of thing, which a lot of parents do, right? Yeah. Not quite in that language, you're often swearing at them at the same time. I love you, but go to bed. <laughs> I, I love you, but... Or, or even they're angry while they're saying, I love you, yeah. right? How dare you do that? I love you, you know, like when there's just rage coming from the person. Then the child is feeling completely two separate things. Yeah. They're feeling the feeling dominantly, mm. and, and and then the thought, you know, gets causes them intellectual confusion generally, like... This doesn't feel like love to me. So you're telling me, so inside of the child, basically what's going on is you're telling me that when you're yelling at me, you're loving me. Wow. And, and, and so they then start, you know, there's a lot of confusion now yeah. in terms of what, between the feeling and the thought. And we've got this for the rest of our life until we open up to it. Yeah, exactly. Until we understand that the, the reason why we're so confused is that what they, we were told was very different to what we felt. Mm. Once we have uh, the ability to, to accurately relay every single time the same thing as we think and feel. The, so in other words, what I feel is what I verbally say at the same time. Yeah. Once that happens, now the person on the receiving end is in no doubt as to my feelings and thoughts. Mm. Because now the emotion and the thought are in harmony with each other. One thing we need to understand with ourselves is that if our emotions and thoughts are out of harmony with each other, then it's very then then the message that God receives from us is is primarily our feelings and not our thoughts. It's just the same as the message that a child would receive from us. Yep. It'd be mostly our feelings and very little of our thoughts. And so we need to understand that the primary method of communication non, the, is really, in a lot of ways, non-verbal, but it can include verbosity, but it is non-verbal in the sense that it's feeling-based and emotion-based. I sort of feel for quite a lot, there could actually be a huge relief in this, finally just being able to say things the way you feel, rather than continuing this facade that we all have. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And... And the main reason why most people don't engage God in that manner is because they're afraid or they're angry. Yeah. So, so they're afraid. So like I would say the majority of people who uh, have religious beliefs on earth that involve an entity, God, mm. are afraid. Yeah. Um, the majority of them are afraid of being punished, uh, potentially being punished, doing the wrong thing. Uh, you know, quite often I get emails from, from you know, both Muslims and Christians 
saying how God's going to punish me for claiming that I'm Jesus and so forth. And, and this, indicate, this is an indication of how little they understand God because they're really just imposing you know, their upbringing and also a lot of untrue beliefs upon what God would do rather than feeling God. Because if they felt God, they'd realise that God doesn't punish anyone at all. Yeah. Right? Um, so, so unfortunately, they they have this um, and they have this belief system about God that is inaccurate. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't create laws with consequences, because yeah. God certainly does do that, and uh, we can see these in operation in a day to day life. But but you can actually experiment with that too. You know, by asking God about God's laws, which is so something I do. We've really got to become children again in this process rather than the, the adult mentality that we have. Exactly, and that's exactly what I said in the first century. Unless you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Mm. Right? But it sort of makes sense now. I've never really understood that verse mm. before. Mm. Mm. So, so if you look at how a child looks at things and communicates even, it very much communicates with feelings. And its thoughts are usually very much in harmony with its feelings. Yeah. Right? They're very honest. And it's only as yeah. it grows that it learns to separate yeah. thoughts from feelings and, and have disharmony between the two. And, and this is how I realised that actually, after a while of experimenting, after this process of experimenting with this relationship with God, I realised actually that it was very interesting because it was exactly the same type of communication that a little child, a baby had. Yeah. And when I thought about the logical, how, how logical that is, it's just supremely simple and logical. Mm. If you think about it, it's like, I now have this beautiful simplicity that exactly the way a child communicates is the way I needed to continue to communicate. Because we're all of the opinion we've got to be serious, okay, I'm now going to talk to God as this serious <laughs> interaction. Yeah. And um, with just no feelings in it. Yeah. And then I started realising too other things like, you know, the sign of an adult wasn't anything to do with thoughts being separate from feelings. The sign of an adult was a person who was self-responsible. Mm. So I realised that a child is incapable of self-responsibility, but over a period of time it grew to have self-responsibility and, and that's how it becomes an adult. It didn't become an adult by acting differently in terms of its intellect. Which is, which is unfortunately the interpretation we have now. You know, most people say, well, you know, that person's too emotionally expressive. You know, they're still a child. Yeah. Whereas I see a person who's emotionally expressive, uh, the question I ask myself is, are they taking responsibility? Because if they're taking responsibility, then they're an adult. If they're not taking responsibility for their emotions and their feelings and their thoughts, then they're still a child. Yeah. Feels like there's quite a lot of children still around then, huh? There, yes, like I've seen many eight-year-old children <laughs> yeah. uh, in my day-to-day -day travels. Throwing a dummy spit. <laughs> yeah, having tantrums and all sorts of things because they are yet to take personal yeah. responsibility for their feelings and thoughts, which is the same thing as a child does. So I'm not suggesting we become a child in the sense of not being able to take personal responsibility. I am suggesting that we need to learn how the child communicates and how we need to continue this form of communication. And once we continue this form of communication with God, we have the ability to learn directly from God, God's nature and characteristics and attributes. So if you think about it, um, the other method was you and I have a discussion about God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we don't involve God in the discussion. Yeah. And we're basically coming up with all these presumptions and assumptions about God. Uh, that, that we have no even idea a lot of the times how to experiment to even find out whether they're true yeah, or not. Totally some guessing. of them sound really good because we like them and sometimes we like them because of the damage that's happened to us. So for example, I, I might come to like the idea that God's going to punish the wicked because every per person that hits me, I want God to punish. Mm. So or I, God loves me because <laughs> no one else loves me. Or, yeah, yeah. So, so I come to understand some things about God that are actually very flawed or some things that might be true but I have no way of determining which ones are flawed and which ones are true, right? Yeah. And so this is what happens with most religion. And it happens with most religion even in the spirit world. After a person's passed, they still go through the same experimenting process. They still go through trying to determine what the truth is. They use, try to use their intellect in every possible way they can to determine what the truth is and, and are just as unsuccessful or successful as we are here on earth. Mm -hmm. So you imagine you and I, we're talking about God 
and 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 God's not even involved. Like he, he, he's over here saying, well, "What about me? Like, uh, can I say what I'm like?" And, you know, and, yeah. and we're going, "No, no, we don't want to hear from you. We're just going to work." We're going to tell you what you're like. What you're like. <laughs> we're clever enough to do this without even involving you, right? Is what we say. So there's a real arrogance in us, even. There is. Wow. Yeah, terrible arrogance. Well, this is what we about. do. Like this is what we do, not just with God. Like as you were saying about observing your life and what's going on. This is what I do. With all sorts of people, yeah, yeah, you know, and it's it's quite good. <laughs> Lovely crackling in the background of our yeah. fire, <laughs> keeping us well. But yeah, you're right. It's a, um, and the, the 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 problem that we have here on Earth a lot of times is that we are so arrogant to think that we don't even have to involve a third party yeah. before we know them. Yeah. But, you know, let's say. And I have this happen to me all the time where people discuss me on the internet and discuss what they think I'm like and rah, 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 but they've never met me. Mm. That's a that's a height of arrogance, really, not having even met the person and not have, having even had one interaction with a person mm. thinking that you actually know the person or know their feelings. Or and, seen how you live. And even. know their thoughts and see, you know know everything about them. It's, it's, and, and we do this with God all the time. Mm. We, we don't connect with God, most of us on the planet. We think we are, but we're not connecting with God. We're often connecting with spirits who think they're God or, or people or not connecting with God at all. We're just imagining what God is in a lot of ways. And it's the height of arrogance to think that we can sit down and imagine what God is without involving God in the process. So, so any, I, I feel, for that reason, many atheists are far better off on the planet than many religious persons on the planet. And the reason why is many religious persons have this arrogance in them that they know God, when in the reality is they have not communicated with God from an emotional... They have not received yeah. love from God. They don't know anything about God's nature or characteristics. They've only been told it mm. by other people who also don't know. And, and, and to actually then assume that you know, you're better off being an atheist who doesn't assume any of that at all, mm-hmm. or an atheist who, who assumes there is no God. What's the difference? So, so I feel a lot of times uh, what religion has done to man is, is just as damaging and sometimes far more damaging if you look at the history of wars and so forth on the planet, often far more damaging than what science has done to man. So um, the, the, the problem I see in the end is that unless we all consider that we, are all, we all have the personal capacity to connect to God mm. and unless we give up this idea that we can hear God, Hear, yes. hear God with our ear, and unless we give up the idea that we that that the thoughts that come into our mind are from God because they are not, and we understand that God's method of communication with us is far more advanced, mm. but far more simple than that. Yeah. Then, uh, unless we give up all of those concepts, we're never really going to discover God's nature, characteristics, or attributes. And, and this is one of the primary things I taught in the first century um, that we had to begin to feel. And we needed to have some... And this is like feeling. It was a lot about what humility, like having the humility to go, OK, what are my feelings here? And also the humility to go, OK, I, I, I can't even really feel myself at the moment, so how am I ever going to feel anybody else or God if I can't even feel myself, you know? Yeah, we don't like admitting to ourselves that we don't know, do we? And that's when we start this guessing game. That's right. And and in fact, in our, in the power of our intellect, what we often do is we take this arrogant position that we should be able to work it out. Yeah. And and unfortunately, we do that with a lot of our relationships, not just our relationship with God, but a lot of our relationships here on earth. We, we believe we know the person that we have n- no knowledge of at all because we can't feel them. Yeah. And it's the same with God. We believe we know God when we have no knowledge of God at all because we can't feel God. And, uh, and so, you know, it's very, very difficult for us then to know the truth about God if we can't feel God. And also, it makes sense that the, a person who knows themselves and, and a being who knows themselves, now obviously God knows herself very well, and... Would, would naturally be the best person to ask about themselves. Mm. Now, a person who doesn't know themselves very well mm. is not the best person to ask about themselves generally. Mm. Right? But uh, if you think about God, obviously God would know herself very well, so therefore 
she is the best person to communicate with to find out about herself. I know she's said herself a few times, and I'm sure that's going to be quite confusing to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Do you want to just share a bit more about how God is well, more than Well, I use the uh, herself, himself interchangeably, as yeah. I always have done. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is because God has masculine traits and characteristics, and God has feminine traits and characteristics. And, and, but, but I don't like calling God itself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because it depersonalizes what is what is really the opposite that can occur, and that is a very, very personal relationship with God. So there are times when I feel God quite strongly as my mother. There are quite there are times when I feel God strongly as my father. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in the first century, I used to call God mummy and daddy. Um, that was my term for God. Um, which often religious people were quite uh, confronted by and also offended yeah. about. So rather than calling, in the first century, God uh, was assigned the Tetragrammaton, which was a YHWH in, our, in the translation now, or a lot of people now would call it Yahweh or Jehovah. And um, you know, instead of calling God Yahweh or Jehovah, I usually refer to God as my father or my mother, mm. right? which, which obviously confronted many of the religious leaders of the day because, because I was saying to them through this connection that I was God's son, uh, as are you, of course, but they didn't understand that. They believed what I was saying because I was saying that I was God's son, that I was equal to God, and, and of course there are very this, many distortions of that. So this is where the confusion about you being the son of God, when it really should have been, we're all sons and daughters. We God. are all sons yeah. and daughters of God. Yeah. I, I became a son of God in a unique sense, and, and, and since many others have become the same through the process of becoming born again. The process of becoming born again is this process of receiving divine love to the point where you become at one with God in your nature. So from that moment on, you, under, you, you have the same feelings as God about other things. Not to the same intensity, because God has it to an infinite detest, intensity, and you can only have it to a, some finite level. But you have the same kinds of feelings as God has. And I called that condition at one moment with God. And I reached that condition when I was 31 years of age in the first century. And, but I taught these truths before then. You know, I started teaching these truths sort of around 25 years of age. And even before then, I taught them, you know, in a more informal way. But um, once you become at one with God, now you are permanently connected with God's feelings. So now, instead of so up until that time, you have times when you're connected with God's feelings, and then times when you're not connected with God's feelings. But after that time, you're connected with God's feelings all the time. Wow. Okay. There was a question we wanted to ask you of what it would feel like. And so basically it's engaging this process that you've been telling us about. That That's the only way we're really going to know because there's a lot of people striving to be at one with God. But we were going, well, what does that mean? Yes. And... The only time you, the problem with all any any discussion about God, and in fact, the problem with almost any discussion about anything in the universe that involves feelings (laughs) is, is that unless you feel the feeling, you will never know. Yeah. And personally. I mean, personally. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit like me saying, look, um, you know that wall there? The truth is that at some point in your future, you can walk through it. And you can go, oh, yeah, sure. You know, like, <laughs> and so you try to walk through it now and you hit your head against the uh, thing. And of course, if you ran it, you might be very seriously damaged your head. And, and then you'd go, well, that's not possible, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. you have that feeling that it's not possible mm-hmm. inside yourself. But later in your life, when you realize that it is possible, and you experiment with that a bit and you have a few mistakes where you know, <laughs> and at some point you will actually do it wow. when you actually do it that will be the first time that you know it's possible ah. before then it's just faith before then yeah. it's just an idea a concept of possibility right. but once you actually do it then you know it is possible yes. and it's exactly the same in our feeling based relationship with God you are not. You can talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and intellectualize it, whether it's possible or not. And even you can come up with all these theories as to why it's not possible and all these theories as to how it is possible. And you can discuss those theories to you blue in the face a thousand years time. Yep. Right? And in yeah. fact, there are many people who have passed over into the spirit world who are in the sixth dimension of the spirit world still discussing those things ten thousand years time. Wow. 
who 10,000 years ago they entered and they're still discussing whether God exists and whether you can have a relationship with God really and all these things, they're still, accept, they're still discussing exactly those things. Right? That's quite tiring. But because they have never personally experienced it, That's they can't know for certain. Once you personally experience it, you immediately know for certain. And once you experience right. the at one condition with God, then you'll know for certain at that point that the at-one-ment condition with God is possible. You so, won't know before yeah. then. So until then, it's just having that faith that, okay, and, and obviously listening to some of the teachings that well, the teachings that you're giving the world and also, well, I suppose, other... I but can you see you don't even have to have faith in what I'm saying? No. There's only one thing explore. you really have to have faith in, in and that yeah. is that God provided a method of communicating okay. and expressing herself to you. Okay. And God provided a method where you could communicate and express yourself to God. And you only have to have faith in that. You don't have yeah. to have faith in anything else. You don't have to have faith in a man. You don't have to have faith in a, uh, anything more than that process. It's pretty simple. That there's a simple method. If you can learn to have faith or trust that this method exists, yeah. then you can experiment. And you, initially you don't even have to have faith that it exists. You can just experiment with the possibility yeah. of its existence. Yeah. Right, and that's what I call the greatest experiment. The greatest experiment is the experiment of the possibility of this personal connection and then relationship with God. So, when we start out these experiments, is is what often happens is that we don't have the humility to see what's really going on. So we do an experiment and say, "Well, I'm done work. with experiments like, from yeah. now on." Is there well, a- yeah, the problem we have with God in our experiments is we're often very arrogant. So yeah. what what we do is we design an experiment with the belief that it's going to work, when it doesn't work, we go, it must be God's fault. <laughs> or, or God, God doesn't, doesn't exist. Or God doesn't exist. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yep. Rather than going, well, no, of all the possible experiments that I could have created, I could have created millions of them, this particular one doesn't didn't work. work. And try something out. In the state it. that I'm now in. <laughs> in the state I'm now in. And, and, and so, you know, we need to start having a lot more humility even with our experiments. And this applies scientifically as well. We need to have a lot more humility with our scientific experiments because the reality is that unless we have more humility, we're not going to look at the possibilities that, that, that are much broader than what we currently accept. From so, so do most of us do the scientific experiments because we're wanting to feel clever and we're wanting to use our brain? Is, is that one of the overall objectives when we're often doing scientific? The human race usually goes through two, down one of two different paths. One is they choose something that they, they know yeah. to create experiments based on because, because everybody feels comfortable with that. So it's to, do, it's to do with fear, actually. They don't want to create something they don't know to experiment with because they, then they'll feel confused and they'll feel less worth and so forth. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to have those feelings and so they usually create things based on what they already have established or what, that they know. Yep. Yeah. The alternative is that uh, mankind generally takes this other tack, tack sometimes, and that is this, uh, this track of um, assuming that they can't know anything. Okay, yeah. yep. Do you, do you understand? Like, so if I go into the assumption or the presumption that I cannot know anything ever, then what's the point of making any experiment? Why well, start the experiment in the first place? Why well, even start in the first place? So that gives me a good yeah. excuse to not do anything. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. And so we often either do one or the other. We, we either presume that we know certain things and then base our experiments on what we presume we know, or we presume we cannot know anything and therefore what's the point of doing any experiment and, and we don't act at all. So what a lot of times people have done with God is they've presumed they know God, you know, and mm-hmm. presumed that, you know, God is a God of punishment, a God of rage, a God of anger, a God of, you know, as the Bible often says, and but also other holy books. They presume that, and they base all their experiments on that, and all their teachings on that as well. Or they go down the track, you know, it's impossible to know God at all, mm-hmm. so there's no point in even trying. <laughs> yep. And they give up. What we need to have is a lot more humility than that, even. We need to understand that uh, just the basic principle that if there is a God that exists, then it would make sense that God created a very simple method to communicate with her children. And, and we have the ability to communicate also with God. Yeah. All we've got to do is discover the method. And, and that method, what it, once, we apply, we, once we discover a potential method, we can experiment with it. Now, over, over many hundreds of thousands now of years of human history... 
man has invented many experiments to communicate with God. The only one that worked was the one that I invented in 2,000 years ago. And when I say that's the only one that worked, I'm not saying that it was anything to do with my experiment. It's just I was lucky enough to try to come across a method that, uh, that I could experiment with and discover and through this process learn about God. And, and there are now many people in the heavens of the spirit world who have ex- used exactly the same method and have found exactly the same results. As with any experiment that's truthful, in other words, that any experiment that can be proven to be truth, you can repeat it. Yeah. In other words, you can, another person can do the same experiment and get the same results. And, and regardless of where you are. Regardless of where you are in the universe or where you are on, on the planet, you will get the same results with the same experiment. That sort of comes into our next question. And it was, what role does the spirit world play in its relationship with God? When we're growing our relationship with God, how, how can we either engage or how do we often engage with the spirit world in the, in the loving interactions and obviously also in the negative interactions? Well, theoretically, the spirit world doesn't have to play any part in our relationship with God. So, theoretically, as I've just explained, the relationship with God is just between you, God's child, and God. And as long as you know how to communicate, which is very simple, just feel your feelings towards God, and how you, how you communicate from God, get communications from God, is to feel the feelings that come back in return. But it seems we all get very influenced often when we start these experiments or we're just starting to open up and then we might start getting into some grief and then it gets shut down very quickly. And it's like, what, what are, what's the interactions that we're allowing ourselves to be influenced by that's ha- often happening? Things only get shut down when we resist. So, 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 for example, if we start experiencing some grief, which is about getting to know what's in ourselves, and if I had an openness to experiencing that grief, I could not get shut down. Mm. The only reason why I could get shut down by some external person or, is by them influencing me in some way along a line that I believe I should go. So, yeah, so because we're wanting an ex- we're wanting an exit ex- door, we want a door. So, so when I start crying because yeah. I'm overwhelmed by my own sadness, I'm now looking for somebody to come along and <laughs> this is too much. Help me get away from it. Yeah. And of course, if that person that if that person is a person who's around me on Earth, then that person will come by. Oh, I don't you don't need to feel that sad. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay because that's what I want them to do. Yeah. So of course they're going to do that. That's what I want them to do. And unless they are very, very spiritually developed, they will, they will, they will actually do that. They will, they will calm down my emotion. The same applies to spirits. So there are many spirits around us who, um, who are not developed, just like they were not developed when they left Earth. Mm. Uh, they're now just in an invisible form, in a different dimensional form. And, and they have exactly the same emotional conditions generally as when they left Earth. And so, so they decide... When somebody's having a big cry, and they, the, then the feeling coming from that person is, help me get away from too this much, sadness, too it's much. too much, it's too much. They go up and give them a big hug, and you know the person doesn't see them, but they can feel them, and of course the person then stops crying, and, and therefore does not feel their emotions. So in the end, it is all driven by our own desire. So it's telling us a lot about ourselves when we're going through this experiment process of what's of really coming out of us when we're not even aware of what's coming out of, of us. Of course. So if there's sadness in me and I don't cry, then obviously I have different belief systems and fears about my sadness that I need to address. You know, and, and on the earth today, there are so many belief systems about sadness. You know, I just heard of someone recently where he was crying in his own house and the police knocked on his door and asked him to go, be quiet. He was wow. crying in his own house. And then he said, oh, I'm just crying about how my mother's treated me. And the policeman said to him, um, if that's what you're doing, you should go and get help. Like, he, was, he didn't need any help. He was crying. <laughs> the exact emotion he needed to feel about how he was untreated and he was releasing it. But the policeman was saying to him that he had to go and get some kind of psychological help because of... Wow. Crying. How uncomfortable it makes all of us feel when exactly. someone is opening it's up. It's all about the discomfort of others. And so we've learnt on the planet to, to massage emotion, to, to push emotion around and to prevent ourselves from truly feeling the emotion. And in fact, it's, an acceptable, it's accepted even in, in medical circles to try and suppress emotion when it becomes too powerful. 
And so I'm not suggesting that all emotion is all emotion is beneficial because there are a lot of emotions that are manufactured by a person for all sorts of reasons. It's a bit, it's a bit like your child when, it, when you walk through the candy aisle, you know, the, the, the chocolate aisle in the supermarket, it starts manufacturing an emotion. Like it wants the chocolate, you're not going to buy it, and so it has a big tantrum. That's in a manufacture of an emotion. That's not a real emotion. The real emotion would be just, he'd just have a cry that he didn't get what he wanted or whatever. And, and even that's not a loving emotion because he'd be, he'd be okay with not getting what he wanted if he was really in a state of love. But, but you know, so I'm not suggesting that all emotions we experience are actually that, uh, are, are real in the mm. sense that the true basic causal emotion. But, um, you know, to prevent a person's emotion is not a, a great way of actually Help. finding out the truth about anything either. Yeah. Mm. And this is what we do with our children from such a young age. Yeah, as soon do. as they actually do open up to anything, we squash it. We do it with everyone around us, yeah, like, do. really. Don't, even ourselves. We, yeah. we, if we do it with ourselves, we're definitely going to do it without our children. Um, so, so getting back to the question in terms of the spirit influence, spirits can only influence us. People in the spirit world can only influence us. They're just people. Yeah. They can only influence us in the yeah. same manner that any person on earth can influence us. And that is that we have to be open to the influence. So if we're crying and then all of a sudden we're shut down by a spirit who's, who's telling us to shut up or, or giving us a hug or whatever to get us to quieten down, that's because we wanted it. And we've got to examine what we want. Uh, why do we want that? Because we're afraid. Why am I afraid? And I've got to look at some of my belief systems. There are also, of course, spirits who want what's best for us, even if we don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, and those <laughs> ones try to help us the opposite direction. But... But often um, we have very, very strong addictions, uh, emotional addictions. And so we go for the one that supports our addiction far, Makes it the easiest. faster than we go for the one that doesn't. You know? yeah. 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 And so that's the main limitation with spirits in terms of their involvement. In terms of our discovery of God, spirits can also help us with that in terms of discovering God's nature, attributes and qualities. However, if... We can, we can validate that through our own connection with God. It's a bit like you and I discussing God. Yep. That's fine. Let's discuss God if we're going to discuss God. But don't trust everything that's being discussed. I need to go and find out for myself. You need to go and find out for yourself whether that is what God's nature really is in the long run. So if I'm telling you God's nature is not punishing at all, and in the long run you find out God's nature is punishing, it's obviously going to have a big effect on your life either way, right? <laughs> but, but you need to find out through your own relationship with God. Um, not, not trust. If I'm saying God's definitely punishing, you be careful, Peter. God's punishing you. Know, you've got to be careful what you're doing here. You know, you're going to get punished if you do this. And, and all of my fears coming out. And on the receiving end of that, you go, wow, this man seems to be in a lot of fear about God. I wonder if God's like that. Does that yeah. you know, and then I can communicate with God. Are you like that? Uh, what's the feeling you get from God? Like, is God like that when you connect with God? No, God's totally the opposite of that. In fact, all I feel from God is this loving, peaceful, kind energy that's patient and understanding all the time and compassionate. And then so when somebody comes to me and says, uh, God's going to punish you, I go, sorry, mate. doesn't matter what I'm doing. God's not going to punish me, mm. particularly what I'm doing right now, because I can feel God's peaceful loving nature right as we're speaking <laughs> so and all i can say to the person is i'm sorry but you have a big misunderstanding about the true characteristics of god do you feel god now all the time again like in this life uh, not all the time no it's impossible to feel god all the time uh, unless, unless you have felt all of your own emotions all the time right and i'm not doing that either so so right at the moment my my biggest problems are that I'm still going through emotions surrounding my personal uh, feelings about myself that I'm having to correct and uh, am correct by experiencing them. And as I feel them, then I feel God again. If I block <coughs> them, then I don't feel God. And that's the way it's going to be until I feel everything yeah. and, and until I can feel God all the time again. So, and that's the same for every person on the planet. So you, you can't go through any other process. And, and after a while, after you experiment with that process, you'll find that's true. And then you can ex once you experiment with it, you realise, ah, oh, there's times when I'm completely blocked from God. Mm -hmm. And then you realise at the same time, well, 
They also seem to be the times when I'm completely blocked from myself as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of feeling that that's the same with people. Like sometimes you're really open, well, I'm really open to people and sometimes I'm not. Yes. Which would, there's just so many similarities, hey? I mean, obviously there there's just a reflection. That's why in the first yeah. century I experimented with the relationship yeah. with people because it taught me a lot about my relationship with God as well. Which is great. What, what was possible. I presumed, I made some presumptions in the first century or assumptions in the first century. One of the assumptions I made was that if a God did exist, that that God would be far better than any person on earth right. in yeah. terms of the love that came from that God. So I made that assumption because I felt that that God must know far more than any person on earth yeah. and therefore must know more about emotion than far more than any person on earth and also would be permanently loving far more than anybody on earth. Mm. And I realised that with some persons I interacted with on earth, they were just a pleasure to be around because there was just so much love coming from them. Other people were just terrible to interact with on earth because there was just so much nasty, mm. hatred, rage, anger, fear coming from them. And I realised that you know, we, I had to, had to assume that if a God existed, that that God had to be better than any person on earth. Yeah. yeah, and I'm glad I made that assum- assumption yeah. because uh, as I've as I've connected with God more and more, I realise that God has exceeded that assumption even more f- it, to an infinite degree. Um, that that first assumption that I'd made that God must be more loving than anybody on earth, I started realising you know through this relationship that God is actually more loving than any other being that I've ever met. Mm. Um, and infinitely so more loving than any other being I've ever met. So uh, <coughs> do you know who made God or how God even came into being? No. Yeah. It's a question I've asked God, but it, I also understand why I'm struggling to find the answer to the question. Because if you think logically, um, it's very difficult for a creation to understand its creator for, for example, you know, um, you know, you have these motorcycles here, right? The trikes that, or the, the quad bikes that you use to get around the farm. Um, the person who knows that creation the best is the person who designed it and created yeah. it, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, for me to understand God completely would be like that bike understanding who made it. Right, okay. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Which obviously the bike has no, not much intelligence itself, so therefore it's impossibility. But God's given me some intelligence, but even with some intelligence, um, my, my, my intelligence is very limited yeah. in comparison to the intelligence that God obviously possesses. Yeah. And so, so therefore, understanding the complexities of God it's is going to be quite a long process and a challenging process. And what I started realising is the only way I'm ever going to get some of those questions answered is just by connecting to God more. Right, yep. Because when I connect to God more, I have the ability to hear from God more. Yep. And therefore, to, when I ask questions about God herself, I can feel the answers about, from God herself yep. and therefore understand more about God. But there are some questions in, in my 2,000 years of, of doing that that I still don't know the answer of. Yeah. And that's one of them. Where does God come from? Who created God? If anybody did, I don't even know. I, I, don't, yeah. I suspect not, but I don't know how that's possible. Yeah. And, and intellectually, I can't understand how that's possible. Yeah, neither can I. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> even listen. Yeah. So, so all I do is I go, okay, there's certain things that I know for yep. certain at this point. And there's other things that are yet to be resolved, and I, and I actually now know through my relationship with God that God has a desire to teach me everything. Wow. And, and the only thing that limits my understanding is my ability to absorb everything. Do you understand? Yeah, I, well, yeah. I don't understand, you know, I understand that feeling of the limited, like limited ability to actually get things. Yeah. Yeah. If I could uh, liken it as an illustration, when you went to school as a child, like when you were five years of age and you first went to school, you obviously had a very limited ability to understand certain things. Yeah. So, you know, the school teacher might have started teaching you the alphabet, for example, 
or numbers, you know, from 1 to 10 and then 1 to 100 and so forth. And they, they had a basis then of which to teach you other things. And then when you, by the time you got into high school, you could, you could actually learn complex things, more complex things, things that are related to language. You actually could actually start learning a completely different language even mm-hmm. by that stage. And, and the child is obviously capacity, has the capacity to do that much sooner in life, but often it doesn't. And you learn the language of mathematics as well mm-hmm. in this process, and the language of science and, and, uh, and chemistry and other things. But if you had tried to learn those things that you learned in high school when you were five years of age and didn't even know the alphabet, mm-hmm. can you see it would have been pretty difficult, if not impossible? Yeah. And that's how I see my relationship with God. God God's teaching me a series of things right now. Mm-hmm. And those series of things that I'm being taught right now give me the ability to understand things that he will teach me in the future. Okay, yep. And I can't expect to know everything yeah. right now yeah. because it's illogical. In my own life, I, you know, and in your life, histo- and in everybody's life on earth historically, we know for certain we cannot learn everything instantly. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, I want to. We but want I, to. We often want to. <laughs> but even then, uh, when you think about it logically, we often don't even want to. No, that's true. Because we, we have huge amounts of impediments towards actually learning things rapidly. And we often don't want to learn new things for yeah. lots of reasons. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we even come across the emotions that we have like I'm not capable of learning that thing yet yeah. and we even have to deal with that emotionally but the reality is that learning the learning process about any subject is a gradual thing yeah. the key is whether you can speed it up or not Yeah. and what I found through my relationship with God is that if I learnt about God first then I automatically received answers about lots of other things Okay. And I had the capacity to understand them. Because understanding them had to be, everything had to be understood with some basic framework that God was teaching me. So the problem that I see on earth now a lot with regard to learning is that mankind is trying to learn things intellectually all the time. But they don't understand that the framework of learning is about emotions and feelings and particularly about one emotion. And that is the feeling of love. And once you feel love, and in fact feel God's love, you now have the capacity to learn many things because almost everything God has made or everything God has made is based on love. So you now have the capacity to absorb a lot of things that you couldn't absorb before. Is this also why most of us are so detached from our passions and desires and what our real true self desires to do? In what way? Well, you see a lot of us sort of not ex- exactly happy or excited about waking up each morning and you know what we're actually doing with ourselves like we sort of often feel or you see around you people find it you know don't have any a real excitement of why we're actually here yep and how does that relate to the question uh, just this um opening up so we disconnected from our true passions and oh, desires yes. yeah. because we're not allowing ourselves to feel Yes, yeah, so obviously the problem with, uh, that we have quite strongly here on, on the planet is that we've learned, through, through being taught by our environment, we've learned that the intellect is supreme. Mm. It's incorrect, of course, <coughs> uh, because actually our emotions and feelings have far more capacity to understand many things that the intellect is totally incapable of understanding by itself. But, but we believe the intellect is supreme. So what we've done is we've, we've suppressed a lot of our true desires, our emotions and our feelings. We don't understand a lot of times why we do different things. And this is why uh, psychologists and psychoanalysts have come up with the terms like uh, subconscious to yeah. explain things. I don't believe there is such a thing as a subconscious. I, I believe all there is is the suppressed consciousness in the sense yeah. that in the sense that the suppressed consciousness, which is our emotional feelings, our our true feelings and desires and passions, have been heavily suppressed through this intellectual training program that we've all been subjected Mm. to on the planet. And and this intellectual training program has caused us to heavily suppress our desires, passions and emotions. So, So we now have the incapacity to understand many things that God created for us to have the capacity to understand, but without feeling, we can't understand. Yeah. So, so now what we finish up doing is we finish up 
trying to intellectually understand a whole series of things going on when if we had the linkage with love and we had the linkage with our emotions and our passions and desires and everything, we would almost naturally understand it mm. at a much, much... And we'd start age. discovering God so much more quickly in that process. Exactly. Yeah. Rather than believing that God doesn't exist or believing that God's a punishing God or believing false things about God, uh, we now have a bit more accuracy about God. And, and God's not punishing, so God's willing for us to believe that there's no God. If that's what we want to do, yeah. experiment with that for a while and see how that goes, you know. And God's willing for us to do these experiments. However, obviously, if we have a degree of humility, um, we would probably want to connect with God directly and, and therefore we have then the capacity to learn about the rest of the universe in the most rapid way. And the reason why that is is because God created the universe. So it so makes he, sense... Yeah that if you connect with the designer and creator of the universe yeah. and you connect with them in the only way that God is designed to communicate with you, then God can communicate with you how the universe works. Yeah. And so what I've discovered, like what I discovered in the first century, took, some things took me months to discover that had never been discovered by any person with their intellect up until that point in time. And the only reason why it only t- took me months to discover it is that I accepted God's way of communicating with me rather than trying to invent my own way of communicating with God. <laughs> see, see, mankind in his arrogance, he, he invents ways to communicate with God and then wonders why God isn't listening <laughs> and also wonders why he can't hear God. Yeah, yeah. makes sense, hey. Yeah. Um, on the, it, so with children, the same process applies. Now, if you're a, a parent who has many injuries mm-hmm. and... Obviously, um, suppressions of your children, almost you know, like as we find them out. Um, how do we encourage this in children? Because they could get there way faster than I could. They so could. do I, I don't like, just, like just by talking to them about it. Like I mean, the fastest way to encourage your child to grow is by you getting out of the way. Yeah. But I don't mean by that that you don't have any role. What I mean is that emotionally you have, to get a, you have to get your emotional impediments out of their way. Okay. So, for example, if you have a fear of spiders yes. and the child wants to learn about spiders. Allow them to learn about spiders and with someone who's not afraid of spiders. And get your fear of spiders out of the way. Okay, so I've got to feel my fear You've of spiders. You've got to feel your fear of spiders. <laughs> and work you don't through get the out of that easy. <laughs> Get that fear of spiders out of the way. So your, right, okay. so your child is now capable of going through this process of discovery without your fear being involved. So this is where okay. observation is so critical in this and self-reflection yes. is so critical in this yes. as well. So, so the unfortunate thing that happens for most children is the parents don't get their unhealed emotions out of the way. What yep. the parents do is they impose their unhealed emotions upon the child. So, so in the example I just gave about the spider... Most parents who are afraid of poisonous spiders, Mm -hmm. when the child picks up a poisonous spider and holds it in the hand, most parents would get the cheeky spider off, kill the spider, jumping up and down on the spider (laughs) off, and you know, this poor little creature just gets smashed into the ground, and and then yell at the child in their fear, you know, what did you do that for? You you know, what's going on? And in that moment, the child's, the parent's emotions now are imposed upon the learning ability of the child. So now the child is going to be very opposed to learning anything about spiders yeah. for a lot of reasons, or very rebellious. They'll either go in one of those two directions. They'll, they'll, uh-huh. they'll respond completely to the parent's demand or rebel completely against the parent's demand. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Either one. But they it's won't the be open emotionally to the process of discovery if they go down either of those. So things. if you're completely open as a parent, your child is automatically going to find out about God in that process. And automatically going to discover the universe as well without your emotional impediments affecting the child. So the reality is a parent can have injury, emotional injury, and still not prevent the child from learning. But unfortunately, most parents impose their emotional injuries upon their child. So we do this in all forms of belief systems. So, So... we do it with our belief in nature. So, you know, some of the things in nature we're afraid of, mm-hmm. some of the things in nature we accept. So we impose those feelings upon our children. And so they then automatically reject, generally, the things that we reject and accept the things we, re- we, we accept. 
we impose our scientific beliefs upon our children. Right. Right? So, for example, uh, today it's un- unusual for a person to accept their child experimenting with science, right? Because the, the, often the parents are frightened of that process or challenged intellectually by the fact that the child looks like they're becoming far more clever than the parent is, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so what, what, the chi- what the parent does is impose limitations upon the child's ability to discover. So it's our fear that's wanting to control the process. Yeah. And so what we do is a child might want to discover things like longitudinal electronic mag- electromagnetic transmission of waveforms or something like that, something which is not very common on Earth currently. It was discovered 100 years ago or so, but on the Earth today it hasn't been experimented with much at all. And, and, and we're totally, like, as a parent, conflicted by yeah. that because it goes, what. Well, I know nothing about that subject. <laughs> like, yeah. how, I can't help my child at all. And, and so we impose our own fears about how good we are and, you know, how clever we are upon our child. Or we're afraid that the fact, if, we, if, a pers- if a child experiments with those things, he can potentially be subject to high voltages and currents, which could <laughs> potentially kill him. Yeah. And so what we do is we, we, we are afraid of his death now. And yeah. so we place a heap of limitations of our fear on the child and their experiments and so forth. So there's science gone. So then we, we start looking at areas of chemistry and physics and mathematics and all these other areas, and we've got all of these limitations inside of us as parents in every one of these areas, and we impose these limitations upon the child. So the child now who has emotional linkages between learning and the ability to absorb information in a certain direction. Whenever the parent has fear or withdraws their love from the child... Mm-hmm. The child now has an emotional connection between that form of experimentation and withdrawal of love or fear being projected by the parent. Whenever the parent is in a rage with the child because of something the child did, it experimented with, you know, it might have yeah. experimented with, you know, some chemicals and blew up the kitchen, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the parent, of course, has a lot of issues about that, ranging from <laughs> money to fix it right the way through to the potential loss of life or limbs and, uh, and fears about all of those things. And so, of course, and so, of course, the parents might be in a rage and anger. Now the child's associated their rage and anger with these, these forms of experimentation and, and therefore is far more limited in its capacity to understand. So is this where, as children, we either rebel against that or we go into our shell? Like, we sort of take one or two... We rebel or accept, generally. Mm. Um, and, uh, and when we accept, we become very similar to our parents in a lot of ways. When we rebel, we become the opposite, but it's driven by rage, mm. not, not by love or any other more, more uh, peaceful emotion. Mm. Mm-hmm. So the whole concept, if we're going to love our children, it's simply feeling our emotions and being honouring what we're actually are feeling. If we just even did that, we're allowing our children to discover the true selves. Yeah, like if we if we are if we notice when we are in their way, because as parents yeah. we often get in their way. Yeah. Now I'm not saying that they don't need guidelines, because they because yeah. God created laws, and and all children need to begin to understand the laws that God created. And in fact, one of our roles as a parent is to help our children discover the laws of God. And, and one of those laws is a law of love. So, 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 you know, if a child is punching us and kicking us, then we've got to provide some kind of correction to that. Now, there are loving ways that we can correct that or unloving ways we can correct that. Most of the time, mankind reverts to the unloving ways and not the loving ways. There are simple loving ways that can correct those forms of behaviour and we can teach them law. But we need to get out of the way with regard to our fears, our rage, and all the other things that we put in the way uh, that, that our children then have an emotional impediment to learning. And they also have an emotional impediment then with God because they, oh, they impose... To, see, for, see, for the child when it's young, yeah. it's God is its parents. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a large degree of responsibility as parents to, to stop seeing ourselves as the child's owner mm. and, and, mm. and, and help the child understand that we are not its owner, but we can be its teacher if we allow the child to develop and demonstrate through our conduct the issues of love and free will and other issues that allow the child to develop in a very seamless manner towards God. Once, once we get out of the way even with regard to the idea or concept that we are the child's mm. parent, mm. we will actually accept the concept that God is the child's parent and we are just the child's custodian 
until such a time as the child can recognise its own parent. Mm. And so once we get into that condition, we, as a parent, we will be very, very much concerned about whether we are interfering in the relationship between the child and God. Uh, at the moment, parents are not very concerned about that. They are often, even if they're religious, they're often very much interfering in the relationship between the child and God. And they actually put a lot of emotional impediments upon the child about their relationship with God. So we need to stop as parents to having this arrogance that we are the child's yeah. parents. We can tell you about God. We can tell you what to do. We can tell you when to do it, how to do it, what to do it, and all this kind of stuff. All we need to do as parents is teach the God child God's laws. When the child has an understanding of God's laws, mm. Uh, mm. and to do that we have to have learned them ourselves, of course. Mm. But when the child has an understanding of God's laws, now it has the capacity to connect to God directly and it doesn't need us anymore, in fact. And this is what we're all terrified of, being left alone and suddenly no one loves us. Exactly. Most, a lot of parents have children just for the sake of them, their own emotional, uh, of wanting someone to want them, wanting someone to need them. And so they love their children being dependent upon them. Yeah. It's such yeah. a terrible... We need them to be dependent upon Yeah, we on. need them to be dependent upon us so that we have some role. And, and this is also an emotional impediment upon the child's learning, the child's self-expression, the child's ability to grow, the child's ability to understand God, the child's ability to understand the universe. Because what it's going to start doing is it's going to stop experimenting with the universe yeah. and it's only going to connect with its parents. It's only going to connect with what its parents allows it to do with the universe. So the, the two-year-old tantrum and all that, that's when the child's starting to get all this frustration building up in them about what's happening. With well, as you've learned in your own relationship with the children, the two-year-old tantrum comes from many sources. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, comes, it starts with some parents' denial of emotion. There's often some spirit influence in the tantrum. There's also some, often some unloving behaviour that's already started to develop in the child. Yeah. The key for the parent is to teach the child God's laws. And so whenever there's unloving behaviour, God has automatically an imposition upon the soul that the soul gets correction. So what we need to do is give the child correction. So the fastest way to correct a tantrum is to is to hold the child yeah. and let it have the tantrum. It will scream and scream and scream. And you've got to keep holding it and keep holding it and keep holding it and restricting it from doing any damage. And just let it have its tantrum, let it have its tantrum. And eventually it will get into its grief yeah. and experience its So grief. the beginning of the tantrum, that's yeah. just all this that's anger the rage. coming, the rage coming the out. The rage and some spirit influence often yeah. as well. With, with children in the spirit world who are also in rages, uh, trying to express themselves through the child. You just keep holding the child, keep holding the child, reminding the child, you know, the fact is they're doing something unloving and so they have to be restricted. Yeah. And so you just keep holding the child, holding the child, allow the restriction to occur until the child gets into its grief and then after that the child won't be, you know, kicking or screaming. You can pick the child up and hug it just while it feels its emotions of grief and the child finishes his emotions of grief, they'll give you a hug and they'll run off playing. Yeah. They're all <laughs> forgotten about them. You haven't had to smack them, you haven't had to punish them in any way, yeah. but you have corrected their unloving behaviour. Yeah. And if they do it again, you do grab hold of them again. Mm -hmm. But this time the, it'll be much shorter because they'll realise they can get into their grief much sooner and they'll be less influenced by external factors. And eventually, when they'll get to the point where they're not getting something they want and instead of having a tantrum, they just go straight into their grief. Mm -hmm. And eventually, once all that grief is released, they'll not get what they want and they'll be okay. Wow. <laughs> they'll yeah. be happy with it. So what's the, the connection? We have a desire, and if it's often a pure desire, then you, you see so quickly it's sort of literally there. How does this connect with God in the process? Like when we, we're having this pure desire and then suddenly our law of attraction or whatever it is changes that suddenly there's this beautiful change that happens. Um, can we talk about that after a break? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, we were wondering about um, the way, some of the ways that you have and do practically connect with God in this system, um, maybe that um, would be beneficial for us who would like to form a relationship with God yeah, yeah. Um, and what to do and yeah. like real things. Well, as you can see from our previous discussion, yeah. that firstly there is a need for us to know our own emotional self. 
So we need to know our own desires, know our own passions, know our own longings, know what we want out of life, what, what uh, we're passionate about, and also know how we feel in a negative way too. You know, what, uh, what circumstances and situations make us feel sad, angry, fearful, and so forth. Knowing yourself is an essential part of your communication with God, because you can't really communicate with God about yourself or, or without knowing yourself. And you can't really receive communication from God without being able to feel yourself. Uh, if you can't feel yourself, then, then you can't feel God's feelings for you either. In fact, you can't feel anybody's feelings for you generally if you don't feel yourself. So, so when you wake up in the morning, is that the first thing you do is like just get connected with what's going on for yourself? Yeah, basically, Peter, my, if you could say what my day-to-day interaction is, and I, I basically focus all the way through the day on a number of different experiments, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> and my, every day is an experiment for me. So, so the, the very first moment I, I awake, uh, generally I firstly connect with my feelings upon awaking. Now, if I can't connect with my feelings upon awaking, the first thing that I will do generally is drink one to two litres of water immediately. Yeah. Right? And then I over a period like that's quite a lot of water to the yeah, average I, person. <laughs> like, I guzzle it down yeah. um, over a period of about two minutes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, two, so two, usually one to two liters of water goes into my body immediately. And what's the role of that? Well, water has this beautiful uh, effect. One thing I learned very early in the first century was that water has this beautiful effect on your body of being able to connect everything emotionally to a far greater degree. Water, water is like a transmission medium for your emotions. Right. And, so, and so the more you drink, generally the more connected to your emotions you will become. And so, so normally I drink from four to six litres of water a day yeah. and, and usually two of those litres go down within the first hour of waking. Um, and that, uh, I then g- generally try to just lay there, generally, experiencing what I feel, what, what are my feelings upon awaking. And uh, sometimes I'll be fear-based, sometimes I'll have had experiences in the sleep state that, uh, you know, that I remember, and sometimes I'll have feelings about the day that, that yeah. come up during that process. So immediately I'm starting to get connected to my own feelings. That's the primary thing. Yeah. If you can't connect to your own feelings and get into your own body, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to connect to anybody else's feelings, including God's feelings for you. So that's the first thing I generally do. And I try to stay in that connected state all through the day. Everything I choose to do in the day keeps me connected to my feelings. So it's rare for me to choose to do something that gets me away from my feelings Mm -hmm. anymore. So that's where often food is an avoidance of our feelings very early on in the morning. The cup of coffee. Or cup whatever. of coffee, yeah. sometimes a cigarette for some people, a cup of coffee. Yeah. A big plate of cereal uh, yeah. is a great way of disconnecting from the fear in particular. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people go for a warm breakfast as well. That helps us stay away from our fears. Um, and, and there's a lot of things we do immediately, generally, that uh, within a f- many of us get up immediately and go straight to the hot shower uh, as a way of avoiding what we feel. Um, so there's all sorts of things that we do to, to avoid feelings. What I try to do is everything I try to do, I stay connected with what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, it's rare for me now to do anything. Um, if I can't feel, I always stop. And, so and regardless of what you're sort of doing in the day, when's your sort of first meal, so to speak? Well, um, I usually drink two to three litres of water first in the day. Yeah. And then the first meal that myself and Mary has is usually a meal of fruit yeah. or as a, a, a fruit smoothie mixed with greens of some yeah. kind. So so uh, it's quite nice we, as you've had a taste yeah. of one. So, yeah. um, you know, quite a large mixture of fruit with, uh, with greens. Uh, it's a nice, very nice drink. And we'll probably usually have that around 10 a.m. in the morning or 11 a.m. in the morning, around that time, usually 10, about 10 a.m. Bearing in mind that I normally wake up with, day, with the daylight, if it's, particularly if it's, uh, um, you know, where, we, where, my, where we're home. Yep. Um, so, so we might wake up at daylight, and daylight might be 5.30 or something like that. 
usually by the time we get to eating our meal, we've usually had two or three litres of water mm. by that time. Yeah. And normally done a little bit of other things, you know, like we might go for a walk or do a bit of work or whatever as well um, before before we eat. Is there any particular fruits that you try and avoid or is it just whatever you've got? Whatever we've got available. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times we'll eat it or we'll mix it up in a blender. Um, and what we find is that uh, that then satisfies us until about 3.30 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And Myself and Mary only eat twice a day. Yeah. Uh, and that, so that's your real meal of the day? That when you say our real meal, our real meal of the day generally is just live food, raw yeah. food. Um, so we don't generally cook it or process it. So, um, so we might make a salad or you know, have a mixture of nuts with a salad or something. So like many that. of us spend the whole day snacking in that too. So for yourselves, you, there's very little that you'll have between those two meals as well. If there's something that's tasty around, like <laughs> in the garden or something, then yeah. certainly I'll eat it. Um, yeah. But, but um, you find that the more and more that you own your emotions and release your unhealed emotions, the less need there is inside of you for food. And so you're not using food to satisfy emotions anymore. This is where most of our addictions with food come about through the satisfy. We're trying to satisfy. So emotions. most of us, when we're eating large amounts of food, especially that, that's one of the ways we're avoiding all this, all this grief or fear. Yeah, and food. one of the reasons why the body needs large amounts of food is uh, is because of the, the the amount of strenuous effort it takes to avoid emotion. And, and it takes huge amounts of energy in your body to avoid emotion, so you need to have large amounts of food to avoid it. So high-calorie diets are the results of people avoiding large amounts of emotion and, and needing high-calorie diets to, to... the energy from high-calorie diets to suppress things emotionally. Yeah. The reality is once you uh, no longer suppress your emotions... You can eat all sorts of amount of food from nothing to, to large amounts and your weight won't change at all. Yep. So, so it has very little effect. Food actually has very little effect on your body aside from a healing effect on your body under certain conditions. So one of the reasons why we eat the way we eat still is because we're still dealing with different emotions and as we release different emotions, toxins come out of your body and those toxins need to be dealt with by your liver and your kidneys and other organs in your body. And so you need sustenance for those organs to recover from the dealing with those toxins. Some of them are poison, some of them are chemical, and some of it's like just, just muck from the emotion, you could say. Yeah. And, and your body needs a way of recovering. So, so we, we take a lot of care with what we eat generally. And do you have like funny moments with God during the day, or is it like this discussion? You've, you've talked about the feelings that. Well, that's happened. the other thing I'd like to say is that from that moment of awaking, yeah. communication with God is already mm. going. Does that make sense? Yeah. So from the from the moment of waking up, communication is already happening, and and so if I can't feel my own emotions, I often are asking for God's help to help me feel the emotions. But all through the day, different events occur. And so, um, you know, with people and by yourself, and if you're in a constant emotional dialogue, not an intellectual one, you can actually maintain an emotional dialogue with God while you're maintaining an intellectual conversation with another person. The reality is our mo we have the capacity to experience more rapidly emotion than any other thing. Uh, thought takes a finite time to produce. Emotion can be felt instantly and transmitted. So, so for that reason, it's really easy to maintain communication with God throughout the entire day, even while you're doing other things. But there are times, of course, when uh, some emotions comes up that, that you feel very, very disconnected then from your communication with God. And so my priority then is to work my way through what that emotion so that it's not an impediment to to connecting with God. And so the focus of myself and Mary's entire day is not to do anything else other than remain connected with ourselves and with God and with each other the entire day. Mm. And while we're doing that, we're doing many other things. So we're interacting with other people, we're doing seminars, we, Mary yep. does a book study group, and you know, there's all sorts of other things going on. But we're still trying to maintain during those moments this 
open connection with God and our own. So this is where truth, love and humility is so important in every single interaction we're having during that day. Yes, yes. And whenever you, if you are self-reflective, you will always notice when you're out of harmony with love Mm -hmm. and therefore you know that there are things that you need to learn. You will also be very aware of what uh, is coming at you emotionally from other people. So what, most people on the planet are not very aware of what's coming at them emotionally. They hear the words the person is speaking mm-hmm. without actually feeling the emotions that are coming at them. Or they don't put much store in the emotions coming at them. Whereas myself and Mary, we look sincerely at the emotions coming at us all the time. So, so if we find today that we attracted a whole series of very angry people yelling at us and when we got on the internet there were a lot of nasty emails and so forth, (laughs) then we realise that we're obviously in a state where we're accepting, emotionally accepting attack. And so we look at why we're open to emotionally accepting attack and and usually you do that because there's a lot of grief about attack that you haven't felt. So then you have to feel about the grief about attack. And there are other days when just lovely things come at you all day for the entire day. And uh, and you can just bask in the enjoyment of of that process with God, like you know, and uh, and quite frequently we're we're constantly talking about God, God's attribute, God's nature, God's characteristics, ourselves, our soul, our development, the laws of God, and so forth. That that involves every moment of every day, pretty much. So we don't spend much time doing what you would classify mundane things, even when we're cooking or cleaning or. All of those things. We're staying connected with our feelings. We're staying connected with what we feel about what we're doing. We're staying connected with uh, with God during the process as much as we're able, depending on the development that we have at the time. One of the things I noticed when I came up and stayed with you was just how beautiful and clean your kitchen and your floors were. <laughs> For all those who don't know, it's got these white, shiny floors. <laughs> and the first thing I thought, wow, that's just so impractical. <laughs> you know, why would you have white tiles in your floor? But after a few days, it was just a really beautiful experience. And they were still shiny. <laughs> Staying there. Yeah. Do you like to share about actually your living space and actually how important that is? Yeah, well... I feel quite strongly that our living space um, is a reflection of our relationship with God in a lot of ways. And um, our our living space, myself and Mary's living space, is very much designed around our passions. So we're passionate about a number of different things. Obviously, divine truth is the primary, one of the primary passions. But we're passionate about a lot of different things. In our living space, we've tried to design as much as possible to support those passions. The other thing is that uh, the more self-esteem and self-love you have, the more you wish to keep your environment into, in more harmony with cleanliness. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you look at what God does, every little bit of rubbish that's on the planet, God has a means of cleaning it up. Mm-hmm. Breaking it down. Breaking it down, turning it into something useful oftentimes or turning it into the environment. And it's only the stuff that man creates that God finds often the most difficult to do yeah. that. But even after hundreds or thousands of years, all of that also gets turned into natural matter as well. And so the way we approach it, our living space is exactly the same as that, in the sense that we feel there's a strong need for us to be tidy and clean. Mm-hmm. We hate being messy because it, uh, it means that we can't do our, what we desire faster. Yeah. <laughs> and like when everything's messy, then you've got to clean up first before you can do a lot of things that you desire to do. So we, like, we also believe in self-responsibility. So if Mary creates a mess, Mary cleans up the mess. Mm-hmm. If I create the mess, I clean up the mess. Um, so we have the, the, you know, the understanding inside mm-hmm. of ourselves that... We, we, we need to take personal responsibility. But I've also noticed, even for yourself, I've seen you clean a pot. It mm-hmm. take about five or six minutes to clean a pot. Mm-hmm. But it was like there was this real joy in cleaning the pot. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how, how, how do we get to that point? Because <laughs> well, obviously that's a self-love. Can it... It's a love of a number of things, not just myself. Um, yeah. I, I love the person who's going to pick up the pot after me. Yeah. And so I want the pot to be in as, in its most pristine condition. And so even if I pick it up in a mess, um, I'll put it back to its pristine condition, mm-hmm. as you know. And uh, and if the pristine and, and so it looks like it's just been bought, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And if I keep the pot in that condition, 
then um, what happens is the next person who picks it up has the joy of using mm-hmm. something in, a, in that pristine condition. And the, I also, so there's also a love of others involved. There's a love of myself involved. There's also a love of the resource itself. Um, you know, a lot of mankind's resources took huge amounts of energy to produce. And so an average pot, for example, yeah. stainless steel pot, takes huge amounts of energy to produce. If I don't look after it, then I'm not respecting the energy that went into it, the, 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 the loss of environment even that went into the production of that particular thing. So, so I'm very focused on making sure that that thing lasts as long as possible in its pristine condition. And, uh, and is also available to the next person to use, just as I would wish it to be available for me. And uh, so I, I take to an extreme, I suppose you could say, the, but I, I feel it's too... Oh, it, just, it was fantastic the, to watch. Yeah. I was like, wow. And I enjoy the process of, of making it happen like that. Yeah. But also I, um, I have the feeling, uh, as I voiced in the first century, I have the feeling that I would, I would do to others what I would like them to do to me. So I would like to be able to go to a pantry, pick up a brand spanking pot that's nice and clean and tidy that I don't have to clean and tidy myself and be able to use it without having to go through a process. And so, and so I want to put that pot back into the cupboard for the next person to do the same thing. Does that make sense? Whether they do it with me or not, it's immaterial. Because for, for us, many of us, it's just the avoiding of our emotions that is getting us into this, this tired mentality when we're cleaning up our houses and we're doing this. We're also, just avoiding our feelings. we haven't often designed our home to support our passions and desires. We often have a lot of things in our home that are actually not supporting our passion and desires. There's a lot of knickknacks and other things in our home that we have to clean that we have no use whatsoever. Or jump over. or Yeah, or we have to jump over or move around or manoeuvre around. There's a lot of clothes we choose that are not practical. They don't look great for a start. A lot of our clothes look boring and uninteresting. But also they're hard to clean and they uh, and we can only wear them once and all, you know, all these kind of impractical things. We, we often do a lot of very impractical things with our life which take our time. And our time is the most precious resource. So if I have designed my environment to support my lifestyle, I will make sure that the environment around me completely supports me most rapidly engaging my lifestyle rather than interfering with my lifestyle. And so myself and Mary um, have a very strong focus on having our environment support our lifestyle and not be an impediment to our lifestyle. And we're not perfect with it, of course, but but, uh, we, we do attempt to do that on a daily basis but our emotions are more important than that even so our connection with God and our dealing with emotions is more important than tidying up a house for example or keeping something so if something emotionally comes up everything everything else else, everything else is is dropped we 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 often don't even eat until it's dealt with but um, everything pretty much else is is dropped until we've at least attempted to uh, connect with the emotion that's going on that's blocking our connection with God or with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And so we will often have discussions that last the whole night um, as a result of that yeah. <laughs> or, or very late into the night. If there's something unresolved, we never generally go to bed without it, un- without it resolved, uh, emotionally resolved, not intellectually resolved. And so, so that means, you know, discussing things until the emotions are... And that's like a discovery process that you go through. Of course. And then yeah. you know when you've connected to it because yeah. there will be an emotional feeling. There's emotional release generally and then there's a feeling of peace afterwards that comes yeah. after most emotional releases and uh, and that's the beauty of that process is that you end up in peace with each other, with God, yeah. and now when you go to bed you're in harmony with each other um, rather than in disharmony. So... So you'll talk about it kind of until the emotion is like sort of comes up. Like yeah, and it do. doesn't always come up on that yeah. day. Yeah. But then the very next day we begin our day with the same discussion. Yeah. <laughs> until it's resolved, uh, we will even counsel events until the particular yeah. issue is resolved. Um, so if we've we've organised some kind of event or some kind of you know discussion or whatever, we we will even counsel it. Yeah. Because that's because until we love ourselves, we can't actually share love with others. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So that and that's a sort of a general generalized discussion of what we do at home, I suppose. 
And our meal in the afternoon is generally a fairly light, when I say light, it's, a, it's usually a raw, raw meal involving nuts and vegetables and rarely fruit in the evening for us. Um, I don't like mixing my fruit with my veggies or nuts, so yep. I normally have fruit separately. We eat a bit of fruit during the day, but uh, then we have a meal around four. The reason why we eat before dusk is because we like to have our body have a bit of time off before we go to bed. So when you go to sleep, you actually feel quite light. Yeah, yeah, we don't feel heavy with food or anything like that generally, and uh, and it means we have a pretty good night's sleep generally, and, and unless there's emotions coming up uh, during the night, then we normally have a very satisfying night's sleep. Mm. So. Yeah, but but the key is to maintain to maintain your connection with God. You've got to do ev- what we do is everything we possibly can to stay connected with ourselves and to stay connected with God. So so that involves physical things, it involves emotional things, it involves spiritual things, what we read, what we discuss, what we talk about, what we see. It involves our entertainment, even. Right? So what we choose to do is entertainment. Um, it's not are things that we love doing, that we really enjoy, uh, that we get a lot of satisfaction out of. But usually our entertainment doesn't just have the, the result of ent- ent- being entertaining. It also satisfies a lot of our desires and passions in a lot of different directions. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much for sharing your time. Yeah, thanks for Thank your time, you. guys. Yeah. And look forward to questioning a few more things in the future, yeah. but... I think this is just a really great chance for us all to be able to reflect on this. And yeah, thanks, Peter. Get yeah, some real awesome. hints. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your so. time doing it too. Oh, no, it's been real busy, fun. So, yeah. No, it's been really... Yeah. Anytime. Thanks, Eloise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we'd love to. Yeah. Thank you. Really, really cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.